This is Dr. Karen, and you're listening to the Are They 18 Yet podcast, where I help pediatric therapists become better leaders so they can make a bigger impact with their services. On this show, I'll share up-to-date evidence-based practices, my own experiences, and guest interviews designed to help clinicians and educators feel more confident in the way that they serve their caseloads so they can help school-age kids grow up to be successful, kind, well-adjusted people. Hi there, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 73 of the Are They 18 Yet podcast. Now the last episode, this episode, and then the next few episodes are a series that is designed to give clinicians a framework for how they can shift their thinking on a number of key issues that pediatric therapists have to face on a daily basis that get in the way of their ability to deliver effective services. As clinicians, obviously, it's really important that we know what we should be doing when we are in a therapy session with a student in front of us. But if you are in a situation where you are working with kids, if you're a therapist or a teacher, and you have to design those specialized services for kids, then you know that there's so much more to your role than just being a therapist. And there are so many nuts and bolts and logistics and barriers to effective service delivery. So that's why I have recently shifted my focus to one of clinical leadership, where I help clinicians be better leaders so that they can make a bigger impact with their services. In light of that, I am launching a new program in September. Part of the reason that I created this program is because As I have been in a position where I am providing trainings for speech pathologists in the area of language and literacy, I found that while a lot of the information that clinicians need has to do with really specific tactical things, such as what do I actually do in my sessions when I have a student or students in front of me. And so a lot of my programs up until now have really focused on those very zoomed in specific things that have to do with therapy techniques. But what I found over the years as I've been supporting clinicians is that that is only a small piece of the puzzle that you have to think about when you are a therapist or when you're a teacher or really when you're in a position where you're designing some kind of specialized service for kids. There are a lot of things as far as just organizational issues, political issues, um, just issues with uh, the way that the system is set up. And then also just the things that are going on in the world have an impact on kids. So while it is important for therapists and teachers to have solid advice for, for actual teaching and therapy techniques, there's a lot more to their roles. And it's really important to focus on those things because a lot of times those bigger picture things that have to do with just reforming the system, a lot of times those can actually have a huge impact on what you're able to do when you do have students or clients in front of you. And I have found that a lot of the clinicians that I've worked with, while they do enjoy their jobs, a lot of times they're kind of searching for something more. They want to make a bigger impact. They're frustrated with the way that things are set up now when it comes to just the way that their caseload is, the laws, the um, the way that they have to provide services. A lot of times they feel like they're limited. And at the same time, while they do enjoy what they're doing, they're kind of searching for something more. And they want to find a way that they can make some changes in their facilities, or maybe they want to create some kind of a project in their community or start a business on the side. There's a lot of different things that they're thinking about doing when it comes to just making a bigger impact on their clients, and then just the field as a whole. There's so many different things that need to be done from an advocacy standpoint, from a reform standpoint, 
my doctorate is in special ed. So during that program, I had many opportunities to focus really on the instructional design, as well as looking at the way that school systems are running and figuring out how to redesign the way services are delivered, not just from a lens of what is directly happening in the classrooms, but also just how to make things actually happen using the resources that you have. Because many times, teachers and therapists, they know what effective techniques are, or they at least have the ability to deliver those techniques, but it really is hard for them to put it all together based on the resources that they have. So there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle in making things happen. And it's really important that people who are working directly with kids have access to resources, information, and support to actually be able to deliver the services that they know kids need. So part of what I do is not just figuring out what effective techniques are, but also figuring out how to make them happen. So the doors open to the clinical leadership program in late September. If you are interested in getting on the waiting list so that you can get more information about the program when the doors open up in September, then just go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash leadership. Again, that's drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash leadership. With all that being said, it's time to get into the episode where I will talk about self-care and productivity. Hey there, it's Dr. Karen. And in this episode, I'm going to talk about self-care for pediatric therapists and why many therapists and teachers and really anybody who is in a situation where they are designing specialized services for kids, um, why all of these self-care tips that are out there just readily available are not really making a difference and why there are so many people who are still super stressed despite all of the advice out there. So really part of the reason is that a lot of the tips are super obvious. So, you know, take a bubble bath, go take a walk, find some time to yourself, or even things like, you know, you hear jokes on some of these mom blogs where it's like, go hide in the bathtub with a glass of wine or something ridiculous that's kind of unproductive. You know, it's almost like when people are like, thoughts and prayers, which is obviously well intended, but not actually helpful. And I'm not saying that any of those things are bad things to be doing, except for maybe the hiding in the bathtub with a bottle of wine type of thing. Obviously, taking a bubble bath and doing something relaxing, that's great. We should be doing those things. We should be blocking out time for those things. But if we actually have time, to block out time for those types of things, then the problem is solved. We're, we're kind of putting the cart before the horse there and not really solving the real issue, which is that if you are having a hard time doing things that allow you to feel recharged, then you have bigger problems in your life that have to be dealt with taking one walk or doing some of these things here or there obviously is not gonna really solve the problem. Part of the issue with uh, people who are in a helping profession, so I would say, you know, teachers, therapists, anybody who's in a situation where they are taking care of other people, well, there's this whole idea of work-life balance, and I don't think it's super helpful. It's, you know, the, the idea that you can have balance between work and life is really hard and often unattainable. And people feel bad when they can't achieve it, when they can't have it all, when they can't have the career and the the time for their self-care and then their time for their family and their extracurricular activities or whatever else they're doing. They're, when people are always trying to do all the things all the time, of course they're going to feel like they can't fit it all in and of course they're going to feel unfulfilled. I think one of the most important things we can do and just having a fulfilling life in a career is to start by 
being grounded in reality. When we have unrealistic expectations about what is possible, then it sets us up for disappointment, which is why I've also talked about the whole concept of the shit sandwich, where it's we're trying to create these situations where we're free of problems and that isn't possible. What's more important for us to do is be discerning about the problems that we want to deal with and figure out a way that we can create a situation where we're we're handling problems that we are willing to deal with. We're in a situation that we care enough about that we're willing to deal with the negative aspects that come with it because it's our passion and it's something that means something to us. So I would say the whole concept of self-care and burnout and work-life balance is the same. We have to understand what is actually possible with work-life balance. And so what I think is super helpful is something that I read about in a book called The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. So they actually have a blog post on their website that is titled Work-Life Balance is a Lie. And so in their book, The One Thing, they talk about a concept called counterbalance. So essentially when you're counterbalancing, you're focusing on one area of your life at a time. You're focusing on one project at a time instead of being scattered. Now, at first, this sounds actually unbalanced. It sounds like you know, you're know you neglecting things, but that's actually not true. When you're truly mastering counterbalance, what you're doing is that you're simply directing your focus and figuring out what, it, what your high priorities are, and you're simply focusing on one thing for an extended period of time so that you're not scattered. And what this does is that it actually allows you to be more productive. Now, the caveat is, is that of course we don't want to focus on one thing so long that we neglect the other things. We don't want to spend so much time on work that we're neglecting our family, for example. So while we do focus on one thing at a time, we don't do it excessively. But this can be a lot more helpful than trying to think about all the things all the time. And when we find the right way to do this, when we find out what our priorities are and we figure out the right way to counterbalance, instead of trying to get this unattainable work-life balance, that's where we can actually get to the point where we can figure out how to plan those self-care things because self-care and all those other activities that I talked about, that could be an aspect of counterbalance. But when we're trying to start with that before we know what our priorities are, it can be really hard to fit it in. We're often putting the cart before the horse. So the question becomes, how do we actually do that? Now, as I've said, a lot of self-care strategies I think are crap, or at least a lot of the advice, the way that it's given, is not super helpful. I would say the same thing about a lot of the productivity apps and strategies that are out there. There's a lot of checklists and calendars and and things like that, which are part, like those are tools, those are things that could be helpful within a broader system, but a lot of people find checklists and, uh, and calendars really unhelpful in actually helping to balance their life. And part of the reason that that's the case is because things like checklists and calendars, those are just tools and tools are only as effective as the person using it. And if you don't have a real strategy and a system for how you're using the tools in your life, it can be easy to get caught in the weeds And when you're really zoomed in like that and you're kind of in the weeds just day to day planning a to do list, you don't have your priorities in order. Well, it can be easy to kind of just feel like you're treading water. There is this concept in business and leadership called the 30,000 foot view. And really what that means is that when you're when you're making big decisions about certain projects, um, casting a vision for how you want to spend your time you want to zoom out first before you zoom in because you want to be able to see everything. So again, it's almost like you're in an airplane looking down at a city. You can see everything. And yes, once you see everything that's there and you want to actually figure out, okay, what are specific action steps we need to get done? You do start to zoom in. 
And things like checklists are very zoomed in, but if you don't zoom out first, it can be really hard to figure out day to day what actually needs to go on that checklist in order to move things forward. Now, how does that fit into being a therapist and counterbalancing and feeling fulfilled and having time for self-care? Well, it's, well, it's a couple things. First, I talk to a lot of therapists who they like the situation that they're in. Um, maybe they're working in a school, uh, maybe they're in a private practice, but whatever, whatever it is, they, they see a lot of things that need to be done that can either help their facility be better. Um, they, they see a lot of problems that need to be solved. And many times they feel like they, you know, if only I had this, I would be able to solve this problem. If only I had more time and resources. And the thing is, is that many times if they were to take the time to actually sit down and reflect on whatever it is that they're wanting to solve, they might actually be able to move things forward. But what ends up happening when you are a busy therapist, especially if you're working in the schools, I know that I felt like this when I was working in the schools, is that you kind of put those big dreams on the back burner, whether it be, um, you know, maybe you, you do want to move to a different setting or try to develop yourself and get a leadership position, or maybe you want to go back to school and get your doctorate. Maybe you want to start a business on the side, or maybe you want to just create some project that's going to make things better for the current facility that you're in. Uh, I know that a lot of therapists can, um, they, because they're involved in the services of students in the schools, for example, they really have a good pulse on some of the things that need to happen for kids. So they have a lot of knowledge and expertise that can be really helpful in a school system, but many times they feel disempowered because they feel like they don't have the time, energy, resources to actually make things happen. And it can be really hard to sit down and, and actually think of a solution to to work through a lot of those things. And so what ends up happening, what ended up happening for me many times when I was in the school is that you have these, these like, you, like you're longing for something more in your career, in your life. And you think like, you know, if I had the time and energy, I could, I could find something better. I could solve this problem. But um, because you get caught up in the day to day, activities, the, the things that are urgent that need to be done right now. And when you're just planning your to-do list in the day-to-day -day without zooming out and thinking about the big vision and priorities, it can make it really hard to figure out when you zoom in day-to-day, -day, what's one tiny thing that I can do to get myself towards my end goal of whatever it is. And Here's the other problem with those checklists and, and like just regular to-do lists and productivity apps is that a lot of times people don't even really know what their big vision is. They just know that they're not satisfied in their current situation. They don't know if they want to jump ship and create a new situation or start working on things on the side or maybe if they just, maybe they want to just kind of revamp their the way that they do their current job they're not even really sure what they're working towards and so when we're thinking about oh I should do you know like like when I was in the schools I um I wanted to create some kind of a program that would help with literacy and vocabulary and and specifically because I was an SLP I wanted it to be for SLPs but I think that a lot of other therapists and other you know, other disciplines, uh, psychology, social work, um, music therapy, physical therapy, OT. I think that a lot of other school service personnel, I would include teachers in there as well, probably have some really great creative ideas and, or at least they, they, they f almost like they feel them intuitively, but they're, the ideas in their heads aren't necessarily really fleshed out because they're so busy day to day that they never really have time to get into a creative space to kind of think about 
their their things that they're kind of dreaming up in their heads. Um, and so they're they're sort of like they have this itch and they're like, I know that there's there's something that I'm wanting and I don't even know what it is. And it's, you know, like I, I had that and it used to drive me crazy and I couldn't even really articulate what I was working on. And and so that's why when when I was just kind of trying to, you know, think about random things that I could do to kind of, uh, you know, be of service in the schools and be more helpful and be a leader and, you know, think of creative ways that I could serve my caseload. I kept thinking of all these things that I should be doing where I'd be like, well, I should go consult more. I should go talk with teachers more. I should do some research on different ways I can um, serve my caseload. I should make some resources and make a website. And I would kind of get all these little random projects together. But because I didn't know what my big vision and project was, a lot of times I would just not feel motivated to do any of those things above and beyond. And I would just do the minimum amount to get through my day and I just felt like I really wasn't making the impact that I wanted to because I didn't know where I was going because it's it's really hard to get motivated to go towards some kind of ambitious big vision or end goal when you don't even know what that is. So that's why that 30,000 foot view is really important. We have to have this vivid picture of what our end goal is before we can even figure out what am I actually doing? Like what are the steps that I'm breaking down to get to this end goal? And then in order for us to actually feel motivated day to day and know what to actually put on a to-do list that's just, what am I doing today? We we actually have to think, you know, a year, 18 months, or however long, we have to think way beyond just what am I doing today in order to be able to really make progress on those types of things, especially if we're seeing problems that need to be solved in our current setting. And again, I I, I get it because I know what it's like to kind of just know that there's something more and know that you want to work towards something else, but not even really be able to articulate what that is. Now, I can share some ways that I did this and the way that I flip-flopped, the way that I handled my productivity and the impact that it can have on just self-care and uh, work-life balance and counterbalance and all of those things. I can share some specific examples um, one one specific thing that I did was that I decided to go back and get my doctorate. And here's here's the thing about work life balance and uh, and counterbalance. So as I mentioned before, that you know it it is really hard to have all of the things. You can't necessarily do all the things all the time. So I when I started my doctorate, really wanted to create some type of a program and design something. Like I wanted to create some kind of a curriculum or a course, but I didn't really feel like I was in a position to um, to do that yet because my ideas weren't currently fleshed out. So instead of focusing on that, I focused on learning and being a student. And that's why I focused on on my doctorate. So while I did want to focus on some of those things like, you know, additional leadership things, it didn't seem to be the right thing at the current time. So when I was thinking about counterbalance, you know, I, I had all these things that I could have done. It was, you know, like, do I, do I try to find a different job? Um, do I stay in my current position? Do I try to get some kind of a coordinator position instead of being an SLP? But I thought, you know what, I, I have this full time job that is, you know, like it's it's a job that I enjoy, um, even though there are some problems that come with it and some frustrations that come with it. But I only have so much time and energy outside of this position. So the extra time that I have above and beyond work, I'm going to focus on getting my doctorate and being a student. So that's where I focused my time and energy really for the next eight years. And I definitely had little mini projects that I would do at work during that time. I actually, um, it, it was really nice because during my, my program, sometimes I would have to do projects for 
for school that I could just do at my job. So it was almost like I could kill two birds with one stone. I could take that as an opportunity to do something that already needed to be done at my school and also that I needed to do for my doctoral program. So the whole counterbalance thing and figuring out how to focus, I would do that. I, I was doing that big picture because, you know, for, for eight years I was getting my doctorate and that was kind of like, when I have free time, I'm going to be focusing on on that. Um, you know, obviously I did other things in my free time as well. But when I had extra time that I wanted to focus on work, that's what I was doing. But I also had to think about counterbalance just zoomed in, you know, uh, individual semesters. So I had to think about if I had a big project that entire semester, I had to look at the entirety of the semester and figure out how I was going to pace that project. Because there would be some weeks when I knew I wasn't going to be able to do a lot of the work, a lot of the research. And so that meant that, you know, maybe I had some family things going on and, and those were the weeks that I would focus on family. Um, but then other times when I knew I had the time, I would spend more time on, on the, on the projects and the research within that semester. So I, I would look at it like that. I had to kind of zoom out and figure out week by week and you know through the entire couple months there when I was going to be doing those things. And that was really helpful in planning day to day when I would get to a day and I would think, what do I need to do today? If I had all of that stuff planned out, it really would help me prioritize. So that way I wouldn't feel guilty if I was spending the night working instead of doing family stuff because I knew I had already blocked out and I also knew that I already had those other weeks when I was going to be doing family time and and I mean you can zoom in as as far out and or zoom in as much as you want where you can even counterbalance within one week where you have certain days that you're focused on school and then other days that you're focused on on other things that you know have nothing to do with it but the the important thing is that i had to think about it like that instead of trying to think work-life balance every day because if i didn't do that what i would find is that oftentimes you know my um like I would, I would feel guilty if I was sitting there working on schoolwork and there were there were family things going on, or or there were, um, you know, people who wanted me to do other things. But I would feel a lot less guilty setting those boundaries for myself if I knew what my priorities were. I thought about the whole semester as a whole first, and I zoomed out, and I knew that I was spending time on all of the important things in my life. That way, when I actually had things blocked out in my schedule, I could be a little more unapologetic about how I was spending my time and set those boundaries without feeling guilty about it. One time in my life when the the whole idea of the 30,000 foot view and creating what I what I refer to as the master plan, which is really kind of an 18, 12 to 18 month plan for some kind of a big important project that you want to do. I've done this. I did this when I was working in the schools. If I if I had some kind of a project that I wanted to work on throughout the school year that I saw as um not necessarily above and beyond my role as an SLP, but one of those things where if I didn't do it, no one was going to call me on it, but I saw it as something that was important that needed to be done that mattered to me. But another time when I used this concept and, and it was really important was, was when I did my doctoral dissertation. So when I when I finished my comps, which in I got my doctorate in special ed and at the very end of my program, I had to do what's called COMPS, which is, it, it's kind of an exam, but really how it is, is that your, your dissertation committee, they give you a series of questions and you have to write a, a paper that, uh, that answers those questions. So it's kind of like a mini lit review and you have to design an intervention plan and it's supposed to prep you for your dissertation. It's supposed to give you practice doing research and writing and then coming up with some specific implementation plan because those are things that you will have to do when you're, when you're doing your dissertation and then you have to defend it and go in front of your committee and do all of these things. 
So after I was finished with my comps, which you know is, is a big deal, and I got to start doing my dissertation. So basically at this point, I had been in school for um, you know six, seven years. Well, I guess it would have been, I guess it would have been about six and a half years um, because I went all the way up to the eight year mark for my doctorate because I decided to do dual programs. I decided to do the director of special education teacher program at the same time but um but basically i'd been in school for a long time and normally people when they reach that point in the program um it's possible to finish in four or five years usually it's more like five or six if you're working full time if you're not working full time you can finish it in four years but long story short there's a lot of work that comes before that point before you get to the point of your dissertation and my chair sat me down and she said congratulations you are officially you know you're you're in the final stretch but i want you to know that only 40 percent of people actually graduate f at this point so that means that 60 percent of people do all of that work in their program and then they don't finish their dissertation and so they literally are on the like you can see the finish line to their doctoral program and they don't finish and i actually did some research i used to do consulting and i uh, i helped dissertation candidates or uh, doctoral candidates finish their dissertations and when i did some research for that program i found that just nationally only about about half of people get to that point in doctoral programs, not just my program was a special ed program, so that's why the numbers are a little bit different, but about half of people get to the point of being do done with everything. So it's, it's called being ABD, all but dissertation, where they don't finish their dissertation. And I thought, that is insane. How could you do all of that work and then not finish? And then, <sighs> As I got into the process, I started to realize what the issue was. And, and honestly, when I was doing coaching for for dissertation uh, or sorry, doctoral candidates, really, it came down to it wasn't that they weren't good students. It wasn't that they weren't intelligent or that they weren't good writers. It was often an issue of planning and to be honest, executive functioning. So many you know, a lot of times people, when they when they would come to me for that particular service, when I offered it, they would worry about editing and things like that. But really, when you get to the point of editing a dissertation, you're in the final stretch. People who have a hard time finishing don't even get to that point. It's it's really an executive functioning issue. You they they don't know how to envision this final product and then figure out what their end goal is and then work backwards so that they can figure out day by day within that period of time what they need to be doing. And so this is one example where in my life in particular, it was really important for me to zoom out, get that 30,000 foot view, understand what actually needed to happen and then work backwards from that. And in order to figure out what needed to be happening day to day, in order for me to self-motivate and self-manage to do those things that were going to move me forward in this project and figure out what days do I have to set this very clear boundary and say, this is the day, this is sacred time that I am writing and doing this thing versus you know being pulled in all of these other directions, that in order for me to be able to make those decisions, I had to get clear on uh, on that big, eight, for me, uh, it was an 18 month plan. So this is why a lot of to-do lists don't work for people and a lot of typical productivity and, and even self-care strategies don't work. You know, people are stressed that they're like, and I'm gonna use the dissertation thing for it as an example, but this can happen for, a lot of different things. Again, like I said, if you're a therapist, you might have something that you want to work on that's like a that's a big project and and you get stressed because the problems that you're wanting to work on aren't solved. So with with the dissertation specifically, people would get they would be stressed that they weren't moving forward 
and they would feel like they needed to do self-care because they were stressed so that they would do their self-care, but then they would get further behind because they didn't have a plan and then that would cause even more stress. So the self-care was just kind of a band-aid for the fact that they didn't really have a good strategy and system to be able to self-manage and self-motivate because it's really hard to self-motivate if we just, we can't really feel and sense what that big vision is. And so that's why it's important for you to do what I refer to as the master planning process where we where we start with the big picture and then we strategically zoom into what we're doing day to day. And that is what is going to help you to achieve not work-life balance, but counterbalance. And I wanted to share something really interesting because a lot of times people are like, oh, I hate you know, taking my laptop home and doing reports at home and, and all of this. And, and I honestly, and a lot of my other, um, you know, a lot of the other content that I have out there, one of the, one of the things that I say is like, wouldn't it be nice to not take that laptop home? I absolutely think that we should not be buried in work all weekend and in working all the time. We should make time for other things and have that separation. However, when you think about counterbalance and when you do try to focus on a big project, there are going to be some times that you might have to work on the weekends. So saying that like we're never going to be ever working at night or on the weekend is not necessarily an attainable thing. But the important thing is, is that you want to have more control about when you choose to do that. And what that can do for you is, number one, can kind of set you up for realistic expectations and help you prepare for it so that you do plan some other activities that help you feel recharged and feel like you're not neglecting the other areas of your life. But then also to figure out when it is time for you to actually do those things so you can do it guilt-free. But the other thing is that when you have some project that you're working towards that matters to you and something that you really care about, it doesn't feel as intrusive when you do have to take that time. I remember that it was, you know, we were visiting my in-laws for Christmas and um, obviously we had lots of family time there, but there were times when I chose to kind of sit in the other room with my laptop and get work done. And my father-in-law came in there and were just kind of making a comment about what I was doing. And he was like, you know, I can just tell that you, like, you really care about this. You really love your work. And I was like, you know what? I do. I didn't feel bad that, you know, even though we were, we were, we were having some family time and we were, we were, um, you know, visiting, visiting our in-laws. I didn't feel bad about taking some of that time and doing some work. It didn't feel intrusive to me because I, what I was doing was really important to me. Now, of course, I didn't do that the whole time. That's not healthy. But I didn't feel bad saying, you know what, I do need to take some time for me to get this thing done because I had planned ahead how much I needed to do that. I didn't feel bad about it. And also, I could figure out how much time do I need to take out of this this weekend trip to go sit over here with my laptop. I had a clear understanding of what I needed to get done and when I needed to get it done by. And that really helped me to set those boundaries and achieve that counterbalance. And I think that a lot of times people feel bad. They feel like they're pulled in all these different directions. They feel like they they can't take that time outside of their weekend time. Like I almost sometimes would would feel guilty if I was doing that. It was like, well, it's the weekend. I'm not supposed to be working. I'm supposed to be doing this or that. And and I honestly, I don't mind working on the weekend when it's something that is an important project. I have a clear timeline. I know why I'm doing it. I also know that I am gonna have some weekends coming up where I'm not gonna be working at all because, and I can plan for those types of things. So this is why if we just strictly focus on the self-care first, 
it's not super helpful. It doesn't help you to take a bubble bath if you don't even have a master plan for what you're doing. If you have to just go back to a job that is, uh, maybe you don't hate it, but you have that itch of there's something more out there for me and I don't know what it is. It really benefits you to zoom out and take that time and focus on what it is that you really want and figure out some tangible ways to do it. This is a good place to wrap up. In the next episode, I'm going to talk about how you as a therapist or an educator can make what I refer to as the leadership shift. So a lot of therapists and teachers probably don't think of themselves as being in an official leadership position because they're not an administrator or a supervisor. Uh, Many people might feel that way. But in the next episode, I'm going to talk about how you can be a leader regardless of what position that you're in. And the reason that it's important to do this is because a lot of times we get this sense that they don't have a lot of power, that they don't have a lot of control over their situation. And also there's this feeling that they can't necessarily change certain things because they're not in an official position to be able to do that, at least in their mind. And so in the next episode, I'm going to talk about why that isn't true and why you can be a leader wherever you are. You don't have to wait for someone to pick you. You can pick yourself. So we'll get into that in the next episode. Now, I'm also going to be walking people through ways to make this shift in my clinical leadership program that is launching in September. So if you're interested in getting on the waiting list for that program, just go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash leadership. Again, that's drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash leadership. For now, we will wrap up, but remember that if you found this useful, feel free to share it with your colleagues. And also remember that if you found, and if you found it helpful, then feel free to leave us a review on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. For now, thank you so much for listening and I will see you in the next episode. Mm-hmm.